Thank you very much for coming today. We're going to talk about a um, very serious theme. You know that it's a part of a project we carry on for more than a month called Shoah in Us. And on Tuesday we had a screening of the film when I just really uh, ended up petrified in here. I uh, know that today's theme is as frightening as the film on Holocaust theme we watched on Tuesday. Thank you very much for being brave, coming on, and thank you for being interested and for being involved. My name is Barbara Karpetova. I am a director of the Czech Center, and whatever you would need to ask me for later on, I'll be into your service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Siri Ellinger. I'm Deputy Permanent Representative of the Czech Republic to the United Nations, and I have the uh, privilege to host and moderate the, tonight's panel about the future of the Jews. I'll briefly introduce our panelists. We have an excellent panel. First of all, it's a truly pleasure and privilege to have Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, who is a legend, both of US Foreign Service and American Public Life. He served uh, in uh, Jimmy Carter, as well as Bill Clinton's administrations. He was um, Under Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary of Treasury. He was also ambassador to, the, to this strange animal, which is called European Union. Uh, he's uh, currently serving again in the administration as a special advisor on Holocaust issues. And he was, uh, by the way, behind the landmark 1999 Washington Holocaust Year Assets Conference and is uh, dealing with the, the, these issues for, uh, for many, many years. So we are, we are truly privileged that we will have uh, his, uh, his uh, wisdom to, uh, tonight. Then we have Tomáš Poyar, who is, uh, um, as he told me and told others, who is currently a free man <laughs> after uh, many years serving in the Czech Foreign Service. He started actually as a director of uh, Czech NGO People in Need. He helped to establish and sustain it as a model and example of uh, effective and passionate Czech NGO. Then he joined the Foreign Service. He was the first deputy foreign minister. And he also served as the Czech ambassador to Israel uh, recently as uh, the same position which was held by his uh, father, late Miloš Poyar, who was the first Czechoslovak ambassador to the state of Israel when we uh, renewed our diplomatic relationship in, with Israel in 1919. We are celebrating 25 years of this uh, this year. So thank you so much for being with us. And last but not least, we have um, uh, Mark Podwal, who is a physician and doctor by training and profession, and artist by calling. You can uh, see his artistry in Metropolitan Museum and other museums. He's uh, uh, held a recent exhibition in the Terezin Ghetto Museum in the Czech Republic. You can find his uh, drawings in the New York Times open pages. Uh, he illustrated many books, and he also offers quite unique perspective uh, and in, in insight into the life of the Jewish communities, not only here in the United States, but also in, in the Czech Republic. So I think we have uh, excellent panelists with unique perspective, and I'm really looking forward uh, for our debate. We titled the debate The Future of the Jews, which was actually the title of Ambassador Eisenstadt book published two or three years ago. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, what would you answer differently today after the Arab Spring, after the recent uh, horrible events in, pra in, in, in Europe, including the terrorist attacks in Paris, where again Jews were killed simply because they are Jews. And uh, so that may be the starting point. What is the future of the Jews uh, today in comparison how you saw it a couple of years ago? Well, first, uh, I really appreciate uh, the initiative that Barbara Kortova, my dear friend, uh, has uh, put on with this month-long uh, effort at focusing on contemporary issues facing uh, Jews in Europe and in the Czech Republic. She does a wonderful service. I want to particularly recognize the uh, Czech ambassador to the UN who's here, Dr. Ilta Harva. Thank you, to, uh, Mr. Madam Ambassador, for coming. Uh, Mark and Thomas, uh, it's a privilege to be with you. Uh, I'm going to give a different talk tonight uh, because in my book called The Future of the Jews, How Global Forces Are Impacting the Jewish People, Israel and its Relation with the U.S., I talk about a whole range of external factors like uh, the shift of power from 
uh, Western countries in the U.S. to the East and the South, countries which have different values, and very small numbers of Jews. I talk about how globalization uh, and uh, other issues affect uh, Jews. I talk about assimilation. That's not what I want to talk about tonight. That's not what's on everybody's mind. So now that we just had last week uh, the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, and yet as we were in uh, Davos, the World Economic Forum, which I was there last week, we had these horrific events in Paris. Um, I want to talk about the issue of Jews in Europe and what the future of the Jewish community is in Europe. And let me address it in several ways. First, how in general do we <coughs> honor those who were killed in the Holocaust and those who survived? The first way is to make sure that the now 500,000 Holocaust survivors around the world live out their remaining years in dignity. Surveys indicate that over 50% of those 500,000 survivors live in or near poverty. 85% in Central and Eastern Europe, 25% in Israel, and in the city of New York, the richest city in the world, where there are 60,000 survivors, half live either in or within 50% of the federal poverty level. Now, this is unacceptable for people who suffered so grievously. And I've devoted a lot of my public career, including negotiating $8 billion of recoveries during the Clinton administration, wrote about it in a book called Imperfect Justice from Swiss banks and German Austrian slave labor companies, payments of insurance policies, restitution of art. Um, I continue to negotiate on a voluntary basis with the Jewish Claims Conference, just negotiated a billion dollar home care program through 2017 to provide home care for poor elderly survivors, socialization services, help them with their medicines and so forth. And in the conference that uh, Milos uh, Pohar and I co-chaired, and which the Czech government, to its great credit, initiated with 47 countries in June of 2009, called the Prague Conference on Holocaust Assets, the focus of a five-day conference was on how to help the social welfare of survivors how to help them recover more assets. And it's had some impact. For example, in Austria, Austria now extends to Holocaust survivors worldwide the same social security benefits that they do to their own senior citizens. And interestingly, just within the last couple of months, the Polish government has made some steps toward that as well, although it's administratively very difficult and we're trying to to work that out so it's more accessible. There's a huge amount to be done. We had a concert for the Defiant Requiem Foundation that I chair that honors a Jewish prisoner course at Theresienstadt in the Czech Republic. We found original members of the course. In April of 2013, we had 2,700 people at Lincoln Center we raised, in conjunction with UJ Federation of New York's Holocaust Survivor Fund, almost two and a half million dollars. We're having a second concert May 9th at Lincoln Center. All proceeds will go to that, so you can contribute to helping the survivors live out their lives in dignity. A second way in which we can honor the memory of those who died and those who survived is memory itself. Money is ephemeral. Memory is permanent. And the key to memory is education. So in January of 2000, in conjunction with the Prime Minister of Sweden, 
Prime Minister Persson. We created then with six countries now with over 30, a Holocaust Education Task Force to mandate Holocaust education in schools now in 31 countries. We in the United States set a very poor example. Only eight of our 50 states have any mandatory Holocaust education. But that's absolutely critical as survivors die at a rate of about 7% a year, that the next generation understand what happened when there are no survivors alive. And the theme of our concert on March 9th is Le Dor Vador from generation to generation so that we try to inculcate uh, this education and one of the missions of our Defined Requiem Foundation is to do that and I'm very proud to say that just within the last few weeks uh, Cardinal Dolan in New York has sent our documentary film called Defiant Requiem which has been nominated for two Emmys to all the Catholic Archdiocese in the United States uh, and, in, and ask them to make this part of their mandatory Holocaust education program. So education is critical <laughs> as well. Third, and what is on everyone's mind, is how ironic it is that we talk about how we can honor the memory of those who died and those who have survived to see a revival of anti-Semitism seven decades after the end of the war and after the liberation of the concentration camps. And I want to focus on this. My late wife and wonderful wife Fran and I lived in Brussels from 1993 to 1996 when I was ambassador to the European <coughs> Union. And we traveled widely throughout Europe. And we always knew where the Jewish day schools and Jewish synagogues were because they could be identified by the huge concrete barriers and guards with machine guns outside. Talking about 1993, 94, 95, 96, even then. And it was comforting on one hand and troubling on the other. It's not something you see at the Park Avenue Synagogue or at BJ. And the question is why? Well, let me try to give you a couple of thoughts. For one thing, Europe has been in a long-term economic crisis, aggravated particularly by the Great Recession of 2007. <coughs> And it has fostered a group of populist parties who have gone literally from the sewers into the parliaments. The Jobbik party in Hungary, the Dawn party in Greece, and so forth. This is not the classic church-based anti-Semitism that culminated in the Holocaust. Indeed, the Catholic Church has been exemplary in dealing with anti-Semitism since uh, the 1960s. But let me give you a few facts to show that what's happened in France didn't just come out of thin air. In the UK, during the prime ministership of Tony Blair, there were so many incidents of harassment of Jewish school children on buses that he appointed a commission called the McShane Commission which recommended making harassment a hate crime, punishable as a crime, and was alarmed enough about it to elevate that issue. In 2012, it's almost vanished from people's minds, we had the killings in Toulouse, France, at a Jewish day school, a rabbi and three school children. It was one of 200 acts of anti-Semitism in France in 2012. I'll get back to that in a minute. The Jewish community in Hungary has been targeted for recent violent incidences. 
in Malmo, Sweden, which happens to be an area where there are significant numbers of Muslims. There was a bombing of the Jewish Community Center in 2012. And I'll give you a few factoids and anecdotes. I go to Israel two, three, four times a year. Thomas, of course, lived there as ambassador and his father as well. In 2014, <coughs> the official figures are that 7,000 Jews emigrated from France to Israel. And they expect twice that number in 2015. If you go to places like Granada, which is an upscale suburb of Tel Aviv, you'll see French signs and uh, French papers. <coughs> I had a brunch at friends in Brussels, who Fran and I had known when I was ambassador to the European Union last year. And remember that in Brussels, three people were killed at the Jewish Museum. And at the brunch, hosted by a husband and wife, a doctor and, and lawyer, uh, was their young daughter, who's in her late 30s with two kids and a husband, and I've known her since we were there in the 1990s, and she said, Stu, we're going to Miami. I said, well, I don't blame you if the weather here is lousy, always in Brussels. She said, oh, no, no, we're out of here. I said, what do you mean we're out of here? She said, I'm packing up and we're moving to Florida. There's no future for my children in Brussels. And I said, you mean you're giving up your law practice? You can't practice law in Florida. She said, I'm doing it for my children. Now, Roger Cookerman, who is the head of the CREF, which is the major umbrella Jewish organization, and with whom I was involved in negotiating and signing December 8th a $60 million agreement uh, as Secretary of <coughs> Special Advisor on Holocaust Issues for the deportation of Jews who left France afterward and haven't been paid. And he said, it is a perfect storm of the following. First, it is the far right, the National Front, the Le Pen group, that's always had a sort of neo-Nazi fringe. Not all, but has had a fringe. Second, it's the far left that hates Israel's occupation of the West Bank and views Jews as surrogates for Israel. And third, it's a disaffected group of young Muslims who have not been incorporated into French society, who are angry and take their anger out on Jews. And they have coalesced together. And he told me that in January of last year, a year from <coughs> a year ago today almost, there was a mass demonstration of these three groups in Paris with signs that said things like uh, Jews, France is no longer your country, or Jews go back to Europe where you belong, go back to Eastern Europe where you belong. The Prime Minister of France, Prime Minister Valls, who's terrific on this issue, as is President Hollande, has estimated that there are probably 3,000 Muslims of European origin who are now in Syria or Iraq, perhaps a thousand from France, who then come back armed, trained, and as hardcore jihadists. And that's what we saw at the Charlie magazine, and that's what we saw at the Kosher Mart. And the suspect who was arrested and charged for the killings at the Jewish Museum in Brussels that I've mentioned fits exactly that profile. Born in France, disaffected, went to Syria, came back to France, 
open borders in the EU and kills three people in the Jewish Museum. Now, none of this comes without some backdrop, and let me close with a few figures because it's important to recognize that while this is a fringe, that public attitudes in Europe are very different than in the United States. The ADL recently did a comprehensive survey of anti-Semitic attitudes in 10 European countries. And the results are sober. More than half believe Jews are more loyal to Israel than to their own country. More than a third believe Jews have too much power in the business world and in the international financial markets. Over 40% believe it is quote unquote properly true that Jews talk too much about the Holocaust. And 65% indicate their opinion of Jews is worse as a result of Israel's actions. Even more recently was a report by the European Union's own Agency for Fundamental Rights, which surveyed 6,000 Jews in nine <coughs> EU member states, not, by the way, including the Czech Republic. And these nine are home to around 90% of the European Union's Jewish population. Two-thirds of the Jews surveyed considered anti-Semitism a problem, and three-quarters suggested it had gotten worse in the last five years. A third experienced one or more incidents of verbal insult or harassment in the previous five years. Almost half worry about being victims of insult or harassment, and a third fear of physical attack. Now, this is not what we find in the United States. Yes, there are, if you asked, and they, they, we, we've got recent data, Pews and others, about anti-Semitic attitudes, Jews are too powerful, all the typical stereotypes. You've got about a 20% figure, but it's considerably bigger in, in Europe. I'll close by some suggestions uh, very briefly of what we should do about it, but there's no silver bullet. One is anti-Semitic harassment and violence should be treated as it is now in the UK and in France as a hate crime, including on the internet, which is fomenting a lot of the radical thinking. Second, when crimes are committed with an anti-Semitic motive, EU member states should ensure that law enforcement authorities record the motive appropriately, so we have a real database of violent crimes. Third, the whole issue of anti-Semitism has to be integrated into a broader strategy of human rights, violence prevention, crime, and outreach to disaffected communities. Fourth, Holocaust education, which again we started to meaningful way in 2000, has to become a much more embedded part of education in Europe and in the United States as well. And last, at the same time as we try to encourage an outreach to these disaffected, unassimilated Muslims in Europe, much less assimilated than in the United States, we also need to have much more surveillance on those who are leaving for Syria and Iraq. One doesn't go for a four-star vacation in those countries and then come back to France or Belgium or other countries so that they can be tracked. And that, by the way, was the case with the two brothers in France. They were tracked, but then they basically felt they weren't uh, a problem. So we need a multiple set of education, law enforcement, social outreach uh, to deal with this phenomenon. It is a serious problem. Uh, I am the last person to try to find an anti semite under every tree. I think even in the Muslim community in, in Europe, 
most simply want the same thing we want for our kids, which is education and jobs and a promising future. But to suggest that this is simply uh, a very few fringe people would also be a mistake because we do have this undercurrent of general public opinion that's very troubling and we have a fairly significant number of these young kids who are potential jihadists and they're going to aim their guns generally at Jews as the first priority. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thoughtful and sober comments about the future of the Jews um, in Europe. Now, Tomas, you you have the twofold perspective, being from Prague, knowing Prague Jewish community very well, and also serving in Israel. What are the specifics of the Czech Jewish questions, if there are some? How does it look? How does the future of the Jews look from from Prague? And secondly, maybe, uh, how does it look from uh, from the state of Israel? What's the future of the Jews? Uh, how how do the Israelis see the future of the Jews um, in Europe or in Israel? So what would be your thoughts and comments? Thank you. Well, uh, so starting with Israelis, uh, a lot of Israelis would uh, welcome all the European Jews to Israel, as, as, and especially some. As, uh, and it's true that uh, as, uh, there were thousands of French Jews immigrating to Israel, emigrating from France. Uh, as it is also true that there are thousands of young Israelis going to Berlin and living in Berlin. So it's a, it's an interesting phenomenon. As, as, and uh, for, uh, 70 years after the war, and in the present-day Europe, uh, uh, because it's uh, f f it's uh, f there is a Muslim community in Berlin as well, and a very strong one. As, uh, uh, but uh, still, the Israelis are going there, and the atmosphere there is uh, probably very, very different than in Marseille or Malmö or some other uh, towns or some British towns or in, in the British suburbs. Uh, uh, I think that when when uh, 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 French are saying that and, and, and the estimate is 3,000 uh, Europeans fighting in Syria and Iraq, I think it's an optimistic <laughs> estimate. It's, uh, the numbers are probably higher uh, over the years and, uh, and they will be rising. Uh, and of course the worst affected country is uh, not a surprise, it's Belgium, it's not France. Uh, because it's about 400 people, known 400 people from Belgium. Uh, so, so per capita, is uh, Brussels uh, is uh, is uh, is the town uh, really affected? Uh, and uh, if you look into the statistics, uh, what is the most common name of the newly born children in Brussels is Muhammad. Uh, so, and uh, it also says something. Uh, so, and I think if you would put that kind of survey uh, so in various uh, European countries and, to, and European towns, then it would explain a lot uh, about uh, uh, so the influx of fighters to Syria and back, and also, uh, so also a lot about the threats to the Jewish communities. Uh, so, uh, f and then you have to look also, if you talk about Europe, uh, so then you have to lo look into the Ukraine and Russia, and I would uh, expect that there will be influx of, uh, or emigration of uh, Ukrainian Jews from Ukraine uh, to Israel, uh, sometimes to Europe or to United States, uh, and the same I would expect also <laughs> from Russia uh, in the next, uh, next years. Uh, and from Ukraine, it's from both sides of Ukraine. Uh, no matter where the fighting is, uh, no matter where the propaganda is, uh, because last uh, very anti-Semitic statements, of course, came from the pro-Russian leader of the Donetsk region, uh, so the, the, the chief commander. Uh, uh, somehow this was not, uh, uh, this didn't resonate uh, in, the, in Putin's propaganda from, uh, from Moscow. So definitely there will be shifts of the, of the Jewish populations and, uh, so, and more going uh, uh, from Europe out, uh, so, and uh, as traditionally it will be the two directions. It will be Israel and it will be United States of America, as, as it has been happening, and it will probably be accelerated, which is sad. I, me, coming from Prague, I must say that uh, so the future of Jews in Prague is still bright, uh, so, but of course, the Jew, of course the Jewish community there is very small. Uh, so if you want to talk about Jewish communities, then you have in Prague then you can mention maybe Brno, uh, 
maybe Carlsbad, but uh, it's hardly for Minyan there. So it's uh, it's uh, it's hardly to go to synagogue, and uh, no matter that the Czech uh, Jewish population usually doesn't go to synagogue or doesn't go that uh, often to synagogue. As, uh, but the atmosphere in Prague is still different. As, uh, I can give you one example, which is quite recent. I was approached two weeks ago as, uh, by the director of the Docks. Uh, as, uh, exhibition hall or uh, uh, that uh, they will be uh, putting out exhibition of Charlie Hebdo uh, front pages, about 220 front pages. Uh, uh, and if I can somehow call people in the relevant agencies and the police to know about it, uh, so that this is going to be happening, that the system is prepared. So I did make those phone calls. Uh, uh, so the exhibition was opened a week ago and so far nothing has happened. And uh, I guess, uh, I, I hope that nothing will happen. And I guess it's more, more likely that nothing will happen. Uh, so, and this is still the situation in Prague because those uh, ideas to put the same, same type of exhibitions uh, so, in other European towns, uh, then were scrapped. Uh, the exhibitions were banned for the because of the security reasons, and uh, you cannot put such exhibition out in most of the European or West European towns, uh, uh, and it's not going to happen. Or with really heavy police presence, uh, that uh, you would uh, seem that you would be entering uh, prison uh, or a military base rather than uh, an exhibition, uh, an exhibition hall. Uh, so, so, and the same, I, I think it can be said that uh, from the point of view of the Czech level or of anti-Semitism, it's been always lower than in other parts of uh, the region and in the other parts of Europe, uh, so, which I'm really thankful. Uh, it's for another longer debate and discussion. What are the reasons to that? Uh, so, uh, so, um, and it's still and it's still uh, so very low. Uh, of course, it reacts on the situation as, uh, in other countries. Uh, it's not that we would be immune uh, so from the trends uh, in Europe uh, so, and from the mainstream European thinking. We are not immune. We are much more Europeanized uh, in a way and much more Europeanized every year. Uh, which is in many aspects positive, but it has also some dark sides. Uh, so, and uh, so, so I cannot rule, rule out, unfortunately, the rising level of anti-Semitism or some incidents even in Czech society. Uh, but uh, so definitely it will be always uh, lower than, uh, so, than in, uh, in, uh, in other uh, countries. Uh, because uh, traditionally, uh, so, but also because of the situation now, because of the fact that there is no Muslim communities, uh, uh, so because of the fact that the new uh, versions of anti-Semitism, which are sometimes called anti-Israelism, and, uh, so, and and there are, it's also for another debate, uh, so what is... Uh, what is really the dispute with Israel and is Israeli policies, and what is uh, just uh, framed like that? But it's uh, but the root is is the traditional anti-Semitism, and you can see that in many as, in many aspects uh, aspects there. And 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 there is uh, and, and Czech Republic and Czech society as such is still very favorable to, towards Israel. So, uh, so if, uh, again, this will uh, this will remain, uh, and we will be always, uh, I guess, uh, more pro-Israeli than the. Uh, than the average uh, uh, European society. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that it's not going to be changing because the Europeanization is uh, already influencing the public, uh, so the students, uh, as well as the uh, as well as the political leaders. But uh, so, uh, f, uh, f, uh, to be Jewish uh, so, uh, so in Europe, I think if you are in Prague, you are still uh, and you will be uh, in uh, the most uh, secure uh, place. Uh, and I'm really proud and glad that I can say it. Uh, so, and uh, and I am really strongly convinced that uh, that. Uh, uh, this uh, will be the case. Uh, what is the future? Uh, so I'm also not very optimistic, as, uh, especially in some parts of Europe. I, I think that uh, that uh, so the different sources of, of, of the present day anti-Semitism uh, uh, are probably going to be only strengthening uh, so in, in coming years. 
Uh, so, so I, I think that the, 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 the old traditional anti-Semitism is still there. Uh, so maybe it is not the primarily the church-driven, uh, so, but, uh, so, but it's still one of the sources, and you can see that reappearing, uh, so especially when there is also the economic hardship and, uh, and some kind of turbulence. Uh, uh, but of course, the new sources of anti-Semitism as the, coming from the Muslim community is, uh, and coming from... Uh, so, uh, from uh, uh, not only the ultra left, but uh, sometimes even the mainstream left, which is very much linked to the anti-Israelism, uh, so, uh, which is very much framed in the mainstream thinking of uh, anti-imperialism, -imperial uh, anti-colonialism. Uh, so then uh, so I, uh, I think it's deeply rooted uh, so that kind of ideology inside the mainstream European ideology and, uh, or idea, uh, and it will remain to be. It's, it should, we should not be forgetting that the mainstream idea behind present-day Europe or European Union, yes, and I'm not talking about Brussels bureaucrats, but I'm talking about the leading journalists and, and leading political figures and leading opinion makers, uh, is basically counter-thesis of the present-day Israel. Uh, so, and uh, so, so there is no, and, and, and the divergence continues, and, and the gap is growing. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't think that there will be a change in Israel. I think there will be a change of that idea and ideology in, in Europe. Uh, so, uh, so when it's going to happen, how deep it's going to be, and what turn it will get, uh, so I'm of course not sure. But if you look on the main differences, then the mainstream European idea is uh, anti-national. The basis of Israel is the nation-state of the Jews. Uh, so, Israel is getting more and more religious. Uh, by the way, not only among the Jews, but also among the Muslims, uh, so among the, all across the population. Uh, so, so the, the, the mainstream idea behind uh, the, so the, 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 the European ideology now is, uh, so, and I don't mean it negatively, the, the word ideology, is, is, uh, is anti-religious. Uh, so, uh, if you look into the defense and security, uh, so the Israel is based and must fight for its existence, and it will fight for its, ex its existence, and uh, the army and defense is the core issue and, and core for the decision-making and core for people to go to the army. So it's a completely different view than in Europe, where it's uh, about cutting uh, military budgets, uh, about not uh, fighting any wars anymore, about talking about dialogue, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and waiting for some miraculous solutions uh, which sometimes are uh, impossible to uh, to achieve and I, I think I could continue on that so so these uh, deep rifts uh, will continue and uh, and uh, historically and uh, and and the place Israel place in this in the world now of course <laughs> it will be the lachmus paper of of, uh, of the relations and it will always be transformed into the relations with the Jewish population of uh, each specific country or each specific, uh, each, uh, specific uh, town. Uh, so I hope that it will not uh, really uh, uh, escalate into a deeper crisis, uh, uh, so, but uh, I think that the uh, immigration of, uh, and movements of the Jewish people across Europe and out of Europe will continue. The rift between Israel and Europe will uh, so be deepening, uh, so, so not shrinking. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, hopefully, uh, things will change to the better that, uh, that uh, it will turn back and there will be some kind of more, uh, more understanding. But it will come uh, with a change inside the European mainstream thinking, uh, not outside, because the European mainstream thinking, if you compare it to the situation in the US and in China and in India and other parts of the world, uh, you could see those gaps there as well. So it's not uh, that uh, so that uh, so the European Union would be the rule. Uh, so it is rather the exception to the rule of the present-day world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, much for your comments. So I think it's good to be reassured that even though the future of the Jews in Europe may be bleak, uh, still in, in, in Prague or in the Czech Republic is not as bad. But I think that's that's a typical example of the Czech optimism. You know, it's, it's not that bad as somewhere else. It's as far optimistic as the Czech can get.
<laughs> now, uh, Mark, you've uh, you've illustrated, for example, books of Elie Wiesel. You've dealt with uh, with uh, Jewish uh, legends, old Jewish legends, Jewish mythology in your in your in your work all the time. From this point of view of of uh, hundreds of years or millennia, uh, which you deal with in your work, are we actually discussing something new, or is the future of the Jews? still the same as it was from the beginning. They are fated to be a minority, and they are fated to survive everything. It's nothing new, but there also is something new. Um, much of what the Germans did to the Jews in World War II, <laughs> much of what the Germans did to the Jews in World War II, had their precedence in the Middle Ages. For example, the Lateran Council in 1215 mandated that Jews and Muslims had to be distinguished by their dress. So the Jews wore yellow circles, the Nazis forced them to wear yellow stars. In, in uh, Venice, they were put in the ghetto. There was ridiculing iconography the way there was in Germany. The ridiculing iconography in the Middle Ages was the Judensau, which was sculptures of Jews having intercourse with pigs and eating the excrement of pigs. 25 of those sculptures still exist on German cathedrals and churches. If you take a good look at the facade of Notre Dame, there's ecclesia and there's synagogue. Synagogue is the blindfolded synagogue with a broken staff dropping the Ten Commandments. So. There were all these, these precedents from before, and this was the subject of my exhibition at Terezin last year. Rabbi Pates, who's here, had suggested to Terezin that they give me an exhibition. I decided to do um, a series of paintings on drawings on the road uh, to Auschwitz and the road to Terezin, um, detailing all of these, many of these different massacres, the massacre in Prague in 1389, the uh, the massacres along the Rhine Valley in the First Crusade, the mass suicide in York in, the, in 1190. So much of, much of anti-Semitism, as we know, just didn't begin in the 20th century. In 1899, in, in, uh, in Polna, uh, about two hours outside of Prague, Leopold Hilsner was convicted of killing a 19-year-old Christian girl and it was said that he used his, her blood for making Passover matzah. So it was the ritual murder. The other uh, famous ritual murder was Mendel Bellas in Kiev. In 1880, there was a ritual murder trial in Hungary. In Hungary, at the end of the trial, the prosecutor summed up to the jury saying, the world is watching us. There is not enough evidence for us to convict these, these men. And so they, they were released. So, Anti-Semitism has flourished in Europe, you know, for a, a thousand years. But what's also different is that I was just in London last week for an exhibition of these prints. These prints are now at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. They're being exhibited all over the world. They're being exhibited at the Hebrew University. In London, in speaking to Rabbi Goldstein, where I was asked to speak at his synagogue, it turns out that in, 19, in uh, 1990, there were 340,000 Jews in the United Kingdom. In 2006, there were 270,000 Jews in the, in the uh, United Kingdom. And what happened? Jews left Judaism. They intermarried. They didn't want to be identified with Judaism anymore. And so uh, the, the Jewish population went down. Then it started to go up again because ultra-Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jews started to have in larger families. So I saw one statistic where in the ultra-Orthodox it was 6.9 children per family. When Napoleon invaded Russia, the Hasidic rabbis sided with the Tsar, even though he was terrible. The founder of Lubavitch sided with the Tsar. And why did they side with the Tsar? Because they were afraid that if Napoleon would come and emancipate the Jews, they would leave Judaism. So one of the things that the future of Judaism faces is people leaving Judaism. It's not just purely because they're afraid of the anti-Semites. It's we live in a liberal society, so Jews have other options. Throughout the ages, Jews who were, there wasn't reform, there wasn't conservative, they were orthodox. And so Jews gave up their lives rather than convert, when they even had the opportunity to convert, but the Germans didn't offer them that opportunity. In Strasbourg, in 1349, when the Jewish, the 2,000 Jews in Strasbourg were taken to the Jewish cemetery, and, they were, and half of them were burned alive, the others converted to Christianity. And the reason that they were burned was because it was thought if they killed all the Jews, 
the Black Death wouldn't reach Strasbourg. So this was even before the Black Death <coughs> reached uh, Strasbourg. It said that 500 Jewish communities were destroyed be, be, being accused of the Black <coughs> uh, of spreading the Black Death, including the Jewish community in Erfurt, Germany. In Erfurt, Germany, a few years ago, while restoring the Jewish quarter, they found 3,000 silver coins and a gold ceremonial Jewish wedding ring it plastered inside a wall, uh, obviously by someone who was afraid of the pogrom, thought he would be able to recover this afterwards, but everybody in Erfurt was killed. The, um, then an anecdote. I don't know how many of you know Dr. Otto Pajek. He's the uh, curator of the Jewish Museum. He goes to services every week. He's been trying to convert to Judaism for the last several years. When I first learned that he wasn't Jewish, when, and I was shocked, this was around 1999, I said, did you ever think of converting? He said, yes. I went to Rabbi Sedon, and he turned me away. He said, in Judaism, the tradition is you go to the rabbi, and three times they're supposed to turn you away. He said, Rabbi Sedon did such a good job, I never went back. <laughs> but he has gone back to this Beit Din several times, and he still hasn't been converted. He even had himself circumcised this past year. And so he goes to the Beit Din a few months ago. They start grilling him on the Torah portion as if he's going to be ordained as an Orthodox rabbi. So, you know, this is another problem. In Prague, when I first went there in 1996 for my first exhibition, um, it was mainly elderly elderly men. Now there are dozens and dozens and dozens of children. I've been in Prague when, at circumcisions and weddings, and it's a very vibrant community with a lot of very young people. But because in order to become a member of the Jewish community, you have to, uh, you have to be, your mother had to be Jewish or you had to convert to Judaism <coughs> via an Orthodox conversion, it limits the Jewish community. And so, I, I, I think that's a big problem in terms of um, people wanting to join and, uh, and being rejected. I'd like to add a few things after the excellent remarks by Dr. Polva and, and uh, Tomas. Uh, first of all, to reinforce the current situation in, in uh, France, Roger Kukerman gave me the following. And he's lived his whole life there. He says, I'm born there. I'm going to die in France. I'm a dedicated Frenchman. The government's fantastic. We're going to survive. We've got 500,000 Jews, and we're going to continue to survive. But he said that you cannot wear a kippah on the metro. You cannot wear? You cannot kippah. wear a head covering on the metro without fear of harassment. And that when he had his first term as president of the Creek, which was 2001 to 7, 90 percent of the Jewish school children went to public school. Today, 30 percent go because of the fear of harassment. Now, having said that, I want to reflect on a couple of things, and particularly what uh, Mark said. There is a difference, and a positive difference, between the historic anti-Semitism, which is very well documented and which certainly is an undercurrent, and I mentioned some of the public opinion figures, but the big difference today is the sensitivity of the governments of Europe to anti-Semitism. It has become reputationally bad for a government to be perceived as encouraging or even acquiescing in it. And so in France, with all the problems, the Prime Minister and President have done a remarkable job. I mean, not just in terms of putting thousands of soldiers in front, in front of synagogues and Jewish schools, but in terms of their public statements about the unacceptability of anti-Semitism, about not imagining a France without Jews. And this is true throughout Europe. I mentioned the Tony Blair situation of the McShane Commission. So that's a major change. And while you may be correct, Tomas, that some of the values are contrary to, to Israel, it is also true that the European Union sees itself as an institution promoting tolerance, democracy, and the rule of law. 
And that ultimately is a good thing for Jews in Europe and elsewhere. And last, on the part that Mark mentioned about assimilation, I devote a large part of my book, Future of the Jews, on the issue of assimilation. In the United States, there are about 6.2 million Jews, 6.7 depending on the Pew figures. But we're like an enterprise with two divisions. One very vibrant, healthy, engaged politically, culturally, religiously, socially, in ways that Jews were not so engaged in the 40s and 50s, when there was much more anti-Semitism here. One of the reasons Roosevelt was not more proactive. And the second division is a bankrupt division which threatens the enterprise itself. According to the Pew studies, between 2006 and 2013, 58% of all marriages involving a Jewish spouse and 70%, if you take out the Orthodox, involved an intermarriage. And of those, less than 10% of the non-Jewish spouses convert. And they're not encouraged to do it. And rabbis don't perform intermarriages. Now what good does it do to tell a young couple, intermarriage is a thing that is a reality. We've always wanted to be assimilated, we wanted to be incorporated, and we are. And a consequence of that is that young Jewish men and women meet young non-Jewish men and women. And they fall in love. And if we're going to deal with the assimilation issue, we have to both strengthen the core, we have to make the beauties of Judaism more relevant, and they are to this large core, but we also have to reach out to the intermarried couples make them feel totally welcome in our institutions, even if they don't convert, because they may raise their kids as Jewish, and many do. So um, I've got a whole section on the assimilation issue, but my goodness, at a time when we're talking about the future of the Jews and anti-Semitism, you know, there was the old Pogo line, we've met the enemy and it is us. We can't let ourselves undo our own communities through assimilation and focus all of our attention on anti-Semitism and think that's the only problem, because it's not. We've got our own homework to do to strengthen Jewish ties here and to reach out to the more secular communities and, and to those who want to be or potentially would be incorporated into the Jewish community if they were given half a chance. What, what Stuart said about um, the importance of the government's um, doing whatever they can against anti-Semitism is extremely important. Because what happened throughout history in Europe was that the rulers would just look the other way. And among the reasons they would look the other way is if there were no more Jews, well, their debts went away. So when the Jews were massacred, when the Jews committed mass suicide in York in 1190 in Clifford's Tower, after the mass suicide of 150 Jews, the mob went to the cathedral and burnt all the debts owed to the Jews. Richard the Lionheart comes back from the Crusades, is furious because he would have confiscated all the property. And so a new law gets passed in, in England that all debts had to be kept in duplicate. And, and throughout many of these massacres, the mobs and the, um, and the local lords, they weren't unhappy if there were no Jews. But then in many of the places in Strasbourg, uh, and some of these places, Jews were banned for 100 years, but then they were brought back after 20 when they saw that the, econ the economy uh, required the Jews. When Maria Theresa expelled the Jews from uh, the Czech lands, there was pressure against her uh, to bring the Jews back, and they realized the Jews were so important to the economy that the order of expulsion was rescinded. Well, thank you very much. Before we open the floor for your questions and, and comments, let me just ask one question which came to my mind when, when both of you were talking about the responsibility of the governments and the rulers and the current inacceptability of anti-Semitism. Is it, cannot, cannot, cannot this change as well? Because we just seen the, the huge electoral victory of, of uh, Syriza party in Greece. It's a populistic party which is strongly anti-Israeli and one might very well argue that strongly anti-Semitic. Uh, you will have uh, elections uh, which will bring uh, more successes to the populistic parties in Europe, which are basically, of course, 
socially driven by social topics, but but uh, and they are mostly anti-Muslim. But of course, they are anti everything, anti Jewish, anti 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 other 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 things. And the thing is that we just started to see the backlash and the consequences of the not only the financial crisis in Europe, but the but the, the social crisis when you have a quarter of young population unemployed. Well, they will not uh, return in, in votes. That's a very good point, and I made this in my opening remarks about the rise of populist, uh, xenophobic, and, and uh, anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic parties. Uh, one of the focuses in the, the World Economic Forum in Davos a week ago <coughs> was the fact that Europe is in a significant long-term economic crisis. Uh, we're talking about, at most, a little over 1% growth in 2015 and 2016, uh, low birth rates, low immigration levels, low levels of innovation. So when this happens, you go back to that history that Mark talked about. They look for scapegoats. Why is this happening to us? I mean, look at Spain. Spain's got a 50 percent, five zero percent youth unemployment problem. Um, and what the European Central Bank and Draghi did was tremendous and heroic, but it only gave the European leaders a chance to make the kinds of internal reforms they've been unwilling to do. And as these populist parties grow, the Le Pens and the Jobics and, uh, and, and others, uh, you're getting the same rise in populism in Spain as we saw in Greece. Um, you, it brings out you know, they'll look for a scapegoat, and you know who the scapegoat's going to be. So, I mean, one of the solutions <laughs> of anti-Semitism in Europe is better economic times. I mean, it is. It seems like, <clears throat> I mean, that's sort of papering over the problem. Well, okay. But, I mean, to the extent that people are working, and they're employed, and they have a future, they don't need to look for scapegoats. It's unfortunate that they do when they're are unemployed, but again, stronger economy in Europe together with what I truly believe is a consistent European Union, European member state condemnation, not just rhetorically, of anti-Semitism will help and also it will help if we reach out to the Muslim communities in Europe and incorporate them. And there's one last point, which we've ignored. And I'm going to say it. It's a, it's a part of this, and we have to realize it. And that is Israel's own policies. Now, it's unfair to say that Israel causes anti-Semitism. That's not the case. But it is the case that when the left in Europe and the Muslims see the Palestinian issue being unresolved, it creates uh, an undergirding for these instincts. And so it's important, if Israel wants to be seen and wants itself to be seen as the state of the Jewish people, that while they always have to act as a sovereign state in their own defense, they also have to take into account how their actions are seen elsewhere. I have, a, again, another, it's another speech, but it's related. It's part of another part of my book, which is the so-called BDS campaign, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction campaign, which is rampant in Europe. We've got 14 EU foreign ministers last year who signed a letter to Barroso, the president of the European Commission, urging that there be labels on any Israeli product made in the West Bank. The European Union has a huge research and science program for which Israel is the third largest beneficiary and the largest non-EU member state beneficiary. 600 million euros for research and development. And they now have said in their iteration last year, they'll give Nothing to any Israeli institution, university, Technion, Weizmann, corporate, 
that has any connection with the West Bank, however benign. There's a virtual boycott by UK professors and universities of dealing with Israeli universities who have nothing to do with the occupation. So what, what happens is that the, the nub of a problem, which is a Palestinian problem, it's got to be resolved. It's got to be resolved for Israel to remain a Jewish democratic state. Gets writ large so that institutions which have nothing to do with Israeli policy get, in effect, tarred and feathered with the same policy in Europe. It's a very serious, growing problem. And Dennis Ross and I chair something called the Jewish People's Policy Institute in Israel, which was created by the Jewish agency to look at strategic issues facing Israel and Jewish people. We're doing a major BDS study, which will be completed shortly. We're in like 25 chapters. It's a very, very serious problem. And it plays back into uh, the European context. Well, thank you very much for all your comments and thoughts. Now, for uh, for sake of you being heard when you ask your questions, I'm uh, going to give up my microphone. So it's going to run it around the room. So it's time for questions. Um, we've got the panelists in here to, to answer. Before I um, present my question, I would like to ask you very briefly, is the situation in Prague better because are there less Muslims there? It's part of it. But uh, the situation was better in the past as well, when the number of Muslims in other European towns uh, was irrelevant. But, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it a but it's one part of it. Yeah, it was Czechoslovakia that supplied the majority of arms for Israel in the 1948 war, when we had a boycott in the United States on arms. So, I mean, there's a long history. If you go to the Jewish center, okay, in Prague, in the old city, and you'll see a big plaque from the Haganah thanking mm -hmm but was then Czechoslovakia for their help. Anyway, uh, if I have a few moments, I'm, I'm here as an advocate, maybe an apostle, of a man called Peter Bergson, who represented the Bergson Group, and I'm wondering if any of you or anybody here has ever heard of him? It's amazing. Yes. Have any of you heard of the Bergson Group? No. Yeah. Here's a book about him. Uh, and I, I can't take up the time to tell you about him, but briefly, anybody here? You learned about him? Yeah. Well, my parents were um, very active members. My father was the treasurer of this group. Um, Bergson came to America, I think, in 40, 41, with three other guys, um, and Itzhak ben -Ami was one of them whose son is the <coughs> founder of K Street now in Washington. And K Street. K Street's where the lobbyists are. Yeah. J That's Street. Ben -Ami. Ben -Ami is his name. Yeah. It's J Street. J Street. K Street, K -Street is where all the lobbyists yeah. are. <laughs> anyway, I got the wrong street. <laughs> but Peter Bergson rounded up the smart minds of America during the Holocaust, um, including Eleanor Roosevelt, Billy Rose, um, Senator Gillette, Nancy Pelosi's father. It was an incredible group. He, they staged two <coughs> massive rallies on Broadway, A Flag is Born, and I can't remember the other, but it was Marlon Brando's first appearance on Broadway. Uh, he established so what's the what's the question? Huh? What's the question? Well, briefly, he was a hero during the trying to save uh, the Jews from the Holocaust. In 1944, he blackmailed Roosevelt into establishing the War Refugee Board, and there was a play about this. None of what I'm saying is uh, hidden information. Um, he, he saved, he collected enough money to provide arms for a famous boat called the Altalena 
that's been brought on fire upon and killed 14 people and uh, arrested this man, Peter Burks. Barbara, we, we have to have a question, ma'am. I'm sorry. I am getting You're not to it, please. Peter Bergson was then a member of the Knesset. And he saw what Israel was becoming and quit the Knesset in disgust because he realized, and this is my question, he realized that for Israel to become a vibrant, modern state, it has to be a separation of church and state. It cannot be a Jewish state because of all the things that you said here and the representation of Europe becoming more national than religious and Jews leaving the fold. Uh, there's a different world emerging and tying Israel to the Holocaust, to Judaism, to woe is me, to victimization is not, I don't think, is not doing Judaism any good. Um, and I'm asking you, what is to be done with the state of Israel that has to be a separation of church and state if it is to join the modern nations? Well, first of all, uh, your history is a little off. Uh, this is the third Jewish <coughs> commonwealth in the same land from which Jews have lived in the first <coughs> temple and the second temple. The and it's a okay. modern miracle that after 2,000 years of exile, Jews have come back to the same land. Agreed. Second, Agreed. the United Nations, which is not a bastion of uh, pro-Semitic activity, <laughs> created in its resolution two states out of the British mandate, a Jewish state and an Arab state. And the Arab states wouldn't accept that division, and we've had problems ever since. There is a division between church and state in Israel. Israel is not a religious theological state. Uh, it has a Supreme Court which is entirely independent, which makes decisions based on the basic law. Uh, do Orthodox parties have an influence? Yes. Uh, and do Orthodox rules on marriage and, uh, and issues like conversion? Yes. But Israel is essentially a secular state. It makes decisions with an independent judiciary. And when you say something has to be done with the Jewish, it's the only state for the Jewish people, and it's been the only state for 3,500 years. And I hope it remains for the Well, the times are changing. That's the question. And, and um, we'll get the next question. Jesus said, somebody said, Israel is the state of the Jewish people. Israel is the state well, of the I, Jewish I did say Israel is the state of the Jewish people, uh, so, but I did mention it in the nation state of the Jewish people, in the national part of the, of the Jewishness. Uh, I didn't mention it in the religious part of the Jewishness, but uh, so, on the other hand, if you ask Israelis, there are some Israelis which link it more to the religious uh, aspect, uh, right. but mostly it is to the national aspect, uh, not to the religious aspect. Even now in the debate when it's being proposed, how Israel should be recognized. Uh, and by the way, how it was not recognized as a state of, uh, as a nation state of the Jewish people, but uh, as, uh, as a homeland of the Jewish people, yes. So uh, we, as Czechs, we have it more simple. You are a Czech, which means nationality and not a religion. So we, okay. is that, it's, it's in Judaism, it's a little bit more problematic, but I did say it especially, and, and I did mean it in the, in the comparison with Europe on the, on the nation state uh, issue, not the religious state issue. I think we mentioned a few times the question of the economic downturn since 2007, 2008, and perhaps this addresses the far left or the far right rise in the European context. But wouldn't the Muslim issue that's come up, I guess, more recently with uh, you know, the 3,000 or so we're going to ISIS, wouldn't this exist anyhow, regardless of an economic uplift that would lift everybody, perhaps? Yes, and, and you know, let, let's put this in context. We suffered through the Great Recession ourselves mm -hmm. in the United States, horrifically. And, you know, I, I started saying to myself, 2007, and 8, 9, are they going to, I mean, we had Bernie Madoff and all 
You know, are they going to start blaming, that is the American people, are they going to blame the Great Recession on quote unquote Jewish bankers? Not that Jamie Dimon is particularly Jewish as far as I know, but the point is, were they going to go back to this kind of stereotype? And the answer was no. So there is a very different public attitude today, not in the 1940s, today, toward Jews than there was then and there than there is now in Europe. That's why I cited some of these figures uh, of very high percentages of the European public having the old canard about Jews having too much power and so forth. So the very same recession that hits us and hits them gets a very different reaction here than there. Also in the 1970s, during the Arab oil embargo, there was the fear there'd be bumper stickers burn uh, Jews, not oil, and there really wasn't a rise in anti-Semitism during that time. Because it was not the Islamic, uh, so, so because the, the because it's the Islamization and the political Islam which comes into the play, and which is uh, not brand new phenomena, but it's rising phenomena over the last decades, uh, and it's much stronger now. By the way, not only in Europe, uh, but in the Middle East. Uh, and this is the complicated uh, part, uh, which uh, makes it harder uh, for Muslim communities to integrate into the European societies. And of course, the European societies make it hard for anyone to integrate in there because it's not the same type of American melting pot. Uh, it functions differently. So the integration and assimilation in Europe, uh, in the European nation state and nation societies uh, functions differently uh, than here. And uh, it's uh, uh, one part of the problem because it leads to the fragmentation, uh, which was supported then ideologically by the ideology of the multiculturalism, which I strongly believe was very wrong, uh, as it was done and, uh, in Europe uh, in, in many countries, because it did not lead to any integration and, uh, or assimilation issues. It did lead to the separation, to much deeper separation, to much deeper social and economic and cultural separation, which then affects the third and the second and third and fourth generation. And, this, and it's spiraling out as, uh, when, once it's mixed with the political use of religion and political Islam, then we are in the situation now. And I agree that without the 2008 crisis, uh, the problem would be there, the, maybe not as strong, as, uh, uh, because the problem was there before. But look, let's all go away with a very clear point here. If we blame everything on the Muslim piece, we're making a mistake. Yes, the violence, Toulouse, Paris, yes, there's a heavy Muslim component to that, without question. And for part of the reason that Tomas mentioned, they're not as well integrated and assimilated, uh, and they take their anger out on Jews. But let's make the second point, which is the underlying public attitude in Europe, which doesn't lead to violence, but nevertheless does lead to an undergirding of anti-Semitism, is much more virulent in Europe than it is in the United States. It simply is. That's what these figures are indicating. And Mark traced this back a thousand years. Now, it's certainly dissipated the much of the educated and business class don't hold those views, but many do, a very large percentage do. Thankfully, the governments are not tolerating it. That's the big difference. But we must separate the Muslim piece from this more general public opinion piece, or we'll, we're just saying, well, it's just a Muslim problem. That's the only problem. Uh, and I would add to that that we also must not look only to the populism and anti-Semitism of the right and traditional right, but much stronger, at certain cases, the traditional anti-Semitism of the left, which is there, and the populism of the left, uh, which goes then more hand in hand with the traditional anti-Semitism, anti-capitalism, uh, and you can name it anti-colonialism, etc., which Israel then gets much more part of it. Uh, yes, so. and let's remember this also. Europe, Israel, was the darling 
of the European left in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, the Six Day War. It was the little David against the great Goliath. And what changed that attitude is what Thomas so well described. Israel became the, the powerful country. The Palestinians became the quote-unquote victims. And so this European attitude, partly World War II oriented and so forth, in colonialism they, they talked about, this then got projected ironically on Jews who were defending themselves against radicals. The whole question of disproportionate force. I mean, they talk about the fact that uh, so few Jews or Israelis were killed during the last Gaza war. Well, it was not because there weren't thousands of rockets coming from Gaza, it was because of Iron Dome. But let's understand that, that in the formative years of Israel, and through the 67 and Yom Kippur wars, <coughs> it was the left that really saw you know, the kibbutzniks and socialism and uh, equality, these were all values which the academic and other parts of the left saw in Israel and which they now don't see as Israel has become the, the stronger uh, of the parties. In the spirit of asking inconvenient, of stating inconvenient truths or, or uh, asking inc inconvenient questions, uh, and with regard to Israeli policy, what do you think of uh, the Republican invitation for Netanyahu? Well, the Republican invitation for Netanyahu is, is a disaster for Israel. Uh, it makes it a much more partisan issue than it should be. You don't invite a foreign leader without checking with the president two weeks before an election. It's just not done. It has been now been done. It's a very bad idea. It shouldn't have been initiated. It shouldn't have been accepted. It shouldn't have been offered. Uh, and uh, it's 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 an unfortunate uh, it's an unfortunate uh, outcome. Ambassador Eisenstadt has talked about the fascination of the left with Israel until uh, the '67 war and uh, perhaps the Yom Kippur war. What can we do to address the love affair that comes from so many intellectuals who? theoretically defend individual rights, freedom of speech, uh, rights for women, and so on, the fascination with these anti-modern forces uh, at Israel's expense. Uh, I sometimes look at it as the treachery of the uh, intellectuals, la trahison de clerc. And uh, I'm interested in hearing what uh, your opinion is about what we should undertake to uh, try to turn that around. And I'm not sure. Could you give an example of what you what you're left-wing uh, attacks on Israel, sometimes symbolized by uh, the slant of the New York Times, uh, but much worse than that. It seems to me that the intellectuals that put Israel down set the mood yeah. for the media uh, to uh, to continue. Doing well, let me take. I think Mark uh, and maybe Thomas. I don't want to dominate this. So, Mark, why don't you? Uh, I have no idea. Concerning the New York Times, I drew for the New York Times for 40 years for the op-ed page. I canceled my subscription four years ago because I just felt they were so slanted. Personally, what, what finally got me to, um, to cancel were their editorials on health care, being a physician. There was an editorial how uh, defensive medicine does not play a role in uh, wasting huge amounts of money in health care. And as a physician, I know how much defensive medicine waste money. And for the New York Times to be blind for that, I just, that was it. Well, if you are with the media, I wanted to subscribe commentary, print edition to Europe, but it's impossible, because you can have print edition only in the United States, and in this new world, it's impossible to send it probably by mail, so it's it's bad. So even if you if you want to unsubscribe, it's, it works, but if you want to subscribe something, it doesn't work. But uh, so, so, 
it's it's complicated. I think it's a battle to put uh, s, s, uh, to to challenge those views and to put it uh, s, uh, into the perspective. Uh, s, uh, and of course, there is a lot to be criticized on Israel, uh, s, uh, s, and there is a vibrant debate and criticism inside Israel. Uh, but look what is happening in other parts of the world. And if we are uh, talking about media and cartoons <laughs> and uh, the situation in the Middle East, I uh, I'm using the example of a cartoon which was there two years ago and. In Haaretz, by the way, uh, uh, and uh, there was a map of Middle East, uh, uh, burning Syria, uh, shaking Lebanon, uh, chaos in Egypt, uh, death in uh, Yemen, uh, was happening in Libya. So you had all those places, and there stands Secretary Kerry with a stick and Lady Ashton, EU High Representative, behind him. And the only place which is empty, it's the British Mandate Palestine, the Israel Palestine Jordan. Uh, and uh, Secretary Kerry has the stick and says, okay, to solve this mess, we must start here. And uh, because it's very easy, everyone knows the solution. Uh, so it's very easy, it's just you sit down and, 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 and finish it. Uh, so, so just talk, and it's, it's a matter of goodwill. And it's the same for the journalists. I have been working in various war zones uh, so of the world. Uh, so, and of course, it's very convenient and easy to go as a journalist or as a human rights activist, to come to Israel, to go to Ben Gurion Airport. You don't even need visa in most cases. Uh, so you go there, you get access everywhere, you travel around, you have nice coffee shops, nice hotels, you don't have to be worried about drinking this uh, spoiled water. And then you make your activism. And it's very easy to fundraise for that. So there are journalists uh, from every country. There is about 17 Danish registered journalists in Israel. So everyone is there and everyone is reporting <coughs> the stories which are important in the detail, but of course not important in the whole picture. And no one dares to go to Syria. No one dares to go to other places because it's impossible uh, sometimes, it's difficult in other cases. And this is partly the problem, the focus, the, the magnifying lens on the, on, the, on, the, on the Middle East peace process on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, which then complicates I'm not saying the solution because I don't think it's possible to come to an easy to a, a two-state solution. I, I think that we are years uh, far from it or decades far from it. But uh, there is a lot between war and peace. So let's be it always closer to the peace than to the war. Uh, but that much attention and that much aid and that much journalism, of course, complicates the solutions and complicates the, the process. So uh, what can be done about that? Well, hard to say. Well, I, 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 I agree with everything Mark, uh, with everything Tomas said, but you know, Mark is a physician. And there is no immediate solution to the Palestinian-Israeli problem. We just have to face it. Neither side is willing to make the changes and compromises that need to be made. So there is a diplomatic equivalent of the medical Hippocratic Oath. And the Hippocratic Oath is, if you can't cure a patient, do no harm. And so what Israel should do is to try to shift world opinion to make it clear that it's the Palestinians who are the recalcitrant party. And one way to do that is to say, and we've recommended this, our, our group, uh, JPPI, Dennis Ross and I, have to the Prime Minister in the Cabinet, people are going to have babies. Settlements are going to grow. But the settlements should grow up and not out. And they should grow within established territory. So announce the following policy, that all new settlements will come within the three major established settlement blocks, which under the Clinton parameters and everybody else's plan are going to be part of Israel in any two-state solution. The more you, pr these are two peoples who need to be separated. And the more you project that out, the more you play into the whole concept of taking other people's lands and all of that. So that's one way that you begin to shift the rhetoric and let the recalcitrant party be the Palestinians who aren't willing to give up the, their quote-unquote right of return and not on Israel's back. 
But I think a problem is most people don't pay attention. Most people don't really know the history. Most people don't want to know the history. People want just simplifications. And I, I think it's, it's a very, very difficult to get people who are not engaged, not paying attention, to understand the problem. And uh, last thing what I would like to say, it's an irony, but the stronger and more secure Israel is, of course, the more disliked is, mm -hmm. and that's how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So if you would have buses blown up uh, on the streets of Tel Aviv tomorrow, there will be more sympathy to Israel. No one wants that, yeah. or and uh, so this is the this is the dilemma of uh, and and this is uh, uh, it's it's hard to. Uh, it's so you know, it, and Thomas is sorry. Where was the world outrage when a synagogue in Jerusalem, yeah. exactly, had rabbis and congregants just shot in cold blood while they were praying? Where was the world outrage? Where were the demonstrations? Um, and so, and so you know, there really is, there really is a, a double standard. And somehow there's a feeling, well, they had it coming to them. Look, these poor Palestinians. So, you know, whatever one thinks about, and I have major problems with the settlement policies. It's not a justification for murder. And jihadism, <coughs> it's a justification for negotiation and reconciliation. And it's just intolerable to have this kind of, I mean, Rabbi Tursky, who's got all sorts of family in Baltimore and in Washington, uh, my Harvard Law School classmate's wife is a cousin. I mean, it's just unbelievable, um, unbelievable that we could have that. So this is all of a piece. You know, the same jihadists who were at the kosher market in Charlie and Toulouse <coughs> are in Jerusalem. Can I just say something about that? My question is about that. After World War II, after the Holocaust, uh, there were many displaced, thousands of displaced Jews in Europe. Some of them went to Russia, some of them came out of the, of the concentration camps. And then the UN set up displaced persons camps around Europe. Well, they couldn't go back to their homes. If they tried to, they wouldn't be let in or they would be killed. And so agencies like <coughs> Hayat in New York went in and took all of these displaced persons and they, they relocated them. They, there are no more displaced persons camps in Europe. But what happened in Israel is, as soon as Israel became a state, then the Palestinians there were some displaced persons there. But instead of all the Arabic countries, who were all Muslims, instead of them coming in and relocating and integrating these people into their countries, they kept them there for a reason. And the reason was, you can answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a brilliant point. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been kept as pawns in these horrible refugee camps. I mean. When I was Under Secretary of State and Deputy Treasury Secretary, I went to Gaza. I negotiated with Arafat like a half dozen times. I mean, Gaza is terrible. It's a terrible place. And you go to these refugee camps, but, you know, the UN is just keeping people barely alive. There's no effort at all to incorporate them into the countries where they've come from. And let's remember one last thing, and I'm sorry I have to catch a train. I'm going to give you two separate anecdotes. In the 1990s, my wife and I, and Irma Ravanovich and his wife Efrat, who later became ambassador to uh, the U.S. and head of Tel Aviv University, is very close to Rabin. And he had a six-person dinner in a little restaurant in Tel Aviv. I can still remember when we were sitting there with Leah and Yitzchak. The first intifada occurred, and I had no idea what was in what is and what you know. So I said, Mr. Minister, why are the Palestinians doing this? And Rabin was a man of very few words, but very insightful. He said, because they don't like us to occupy them. <laughs> Anecdote number two, that one bullet 
killing Rabin changed the whole history of the region. Anecdote number three, in 2000, President Clinton, Ehud Barak, the Prime Minister, and Arafat. <coughs> Barak offered 95%, 95% of the occupied territory. Jerusalem is a capital. 50,000 people coming back for family reunions turned down. Omer, an even more generous mm -hmm. view with Abu Mazen, turned down. We've got, Rabbi, to, to make, nobody knows that. And we've got to be able to get that kind of figure out. They're too invested in keeping that situation. This has been great. Barbara, you've been wonderful, and I apologize, <laughs> but the Excel train is a...